We want to thank all of you for being here this morning to celebrate Margie McKee's life. Uh, before we begin, if you have a cell phone that might accidentally go off, if you can turn those off or put them on vibrate, we would really appreciate that. If you're not sure how to do it, there's young people here that will help you. <laughs> so we'll give you a moment to check those cell phones. That way we'll keep the sanctity of the moment. We won't be interrupted by any cell phones because I don't think God's going to be calling any of you right now. So I'm going to give you a moment to check your cell phones. And as you're doing that, I want to thank... Um, Billy, uh, Pastor Billy Andre, for allowing us to uh, do this uh, memorial service here uh, for Margie. Um, I feel really awkward um, calling her Margie. I'm going to call her mom. That's what I call her. And so I feel really comfortable with that. So if that's okay, when I say mom or the kids say mom, uh, you know who we're talking about. Uh, that's how we're just real comfortable with it. Uh, so we're not talking about you as mothers. We're talking about her. Um, but we wanted to uh, just let you know that ahead of time, or if any of the grandkids, see the grandkids, grandma will be the, uh, the other name they'll use for her. Um, at, uh, we also want to thank uh, not only uh, Pastor Billy Andre for allowing us to do this, but also his staff, as well as those folks that are cooking in the kitchen. And I'll, I'll say it now and I'll say it at the end, that we're going to have a reception following and there's a really a lot of food and we really need you to stay and eat this food uh, because we have no place to put it afterwards and we're not hauling it down south. So we would like you to take as much, uh, eat as much as you can and if you want to put something in your purse or your pocket and take it home with you, that's fine as well. At this time, Pastor Billy is going to come and he's going to uh, share with us from God's word and he's going to open us in prayer. Psalm 91, verses 1 through 2 and 14 through 16. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. Let's pray together. Dear God, we find great comfort in your word. We come here to remember a life that was lived to honor you. We thank you for the long life that you gave Margie McKee. We also come to grieve and say goodbye, and we know that, Jesus, you give us the permission to cry and grieve because you grieved at the funeral of your good friend Lazarus. But we don't grieve without hope because just like you raised Lazarus from the dead, Margie is with you in heaven right now, and we thank you for that. So as we grieve, we grieve with hope. We grieve with expectation that you have the power over death God, be here during this time and let your truth and your love be evident in this place as we honor you and remember Margie. In your name we pray. Amen. Everyone faces mountains in their life now and then. In 1982, Dad and Mom saw a mountain ahead of them that appeared to be unclimbable. And they knew that they would need help from the Lord to make it to the other side. Their 23-year-old son, Jim, had completed five surgeries that proved to be unsuccessful in trying to stop pain in his arm and back because of a pinched nerve. The family was very discouraged, but they knew that they could continue on. It was also very discouraging to learn that mom had developed another brain tumor. The first tumor had been removed during two very dangerous surgeries in 1975 and 76. And the thought of going through that again was most difficult. The third thing that made the mountain look so high and rugged was dad's mother's Alzheimer's disease. He had witnessed over the previous five or six years the deterioration of the kindest and loveliest mother anyone could ever have. 
She died in December of 1982, just four months after he finished this song. From these circumstances, Dad said, came, Lord, help me over this mountain. And yes, the Lord did help them, all of them, over the mountain. Would you all please stand with me as we sing two songs? The first one is going to be When We All Get to Heaven, and the second, second one is Victory in Jesus.
the streets of gold when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see jesus we'll sing and shout the victory when we all see jesus we'll sing and shout the victory Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning of his precious blood atoning then i repented of my sin and won the victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me Punched me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus. Come and heal my broken spirit And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood He loved me me to victory beneath the cleansing flood I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angel singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory oh victory in Jesus my Savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me Plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. Plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. He, he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Please be seated. Mom had the heart of a teacher. She loved reading and taught me to read before I went to school. She taught me to cook, sew, take care of a home, and love my husband and children. 
She always encouraged me to read the Bible, memorize scripture, and was there to hear me recite my memory verses. Later, she taught her grandchildren many things, including how to bake cookies. Mom had the heart of a servant. She was a hard worker. When she was helping put dad through college, she worked six days a week. She did whatever it took to finish something on time, if it even staying if it up really late to help finish a project. She served in the church also as a deaconess, leader in Pioneer Girls, helper in children's choir, teacher in vacation Bible school, nursery coordinator, and even used to sing in the church choir. She loved the outdoors, looking at God's beautiful creation, especially going to Yosemite and Armstrong Redwoods. She was, a very, she was very creative and enjoyed china painting, flower arranging, sewing, and ceramics. Mom had a heart full of love for God, her family, and others. Mom was happy, content. She had a positive outlook and patiently met each trial handed to her. Mom was 39 and I was 18 when I was standing by her hospital bed just before she went in for her first brain tumor surgery. Trusting God for the best, but knowing that the surgery might not be successful, she told me, I, I'm not afraid, Cindy. Only four words, but I've never forgotten them. I was afraid, but her example helped me to trust God even more. She always told us she loved us and encouraged us. She prayed for each one of us. I will miss her loving eyes, encouraging words, and sweet smile very much. I just want to thank all of you for coming today. It means a lot to us. And uh, as you can imagine, it's hard to summarize anyone's life, yet alone your mother's, in a, in a few uh, words. But we'll, you know, we're doing the best we can here. Um, we shared a lot of good times, a lot of challenging times as well, as Cindy mentioned, and some of the especially physical challenges. But uh, there are other sides, too. Like in second grade, you know, when I was uh, not feeling well, I told mom, hey, mom, I'm not feeling well. I don't think I should go to school. She made me go to school anyway, right? That's what mom was doing. I threw up. It's awesome. A chain reaction started. Next thing you know, mom's down there, has to come and pick me up. She's embarrassed. And from then on, any time I said I wasn't feeling well, I was in, man. I milked that all the way through high school. It was awesome. So it so, uh, came in handy. And then there's the times where, on a rare occasion, I wasn't good, okay? Yeah, she would, uh, you know, want to spank me. And so um, I, I could see the process going towards a wooden spoon, and so I, that mean my feet were running the other way. So the, our house is situated where I could go run around in a circle. She'd chase me. And there's like pocket doors. i go like this, trying to get the pocket door shut, you know, slow her down a little bit. And then you get to the point where I, she was closing in. She just had longer legs. You know, what could I do? So I'd go, all right, this is time. Bolt out the front door. So that's, that's, that's always the go-to move, you know. So I bolt out the front door. And as soon as I do that, she gets the front door. She yells out, if you don't come back here right now, you're going to get it twice as hard. I'm going, why didn't you say that a long time ago, man? I had all this exercise. I'm exhausted. You know, although, and, and then it was also like, okay, or she'd say, yeah, of course, you know, wait till your father gets home, then I'm, and then I'm right back in, because her spankings was nothing like, not that you spank me often, Dad, but anyway, uh, probably hardly ever, um, but anyway, uh, but we did, we loved, uh, had a good time, we loved uh, family vacations, every year we went on vacations, uh, a lot of those were to Iowa, f visit family, and like Cindy mentioned, Yosemite, that was a, a great place we, we loved to go, Mom loved Yosemite. I was doing good. And, um, and mom was a caring, compassionate woman as well. You know, just down the street, there's Earl Baum Center for the Blind. And, and when Earl Baum was still living, she would go down you know, once a week and cook dinner and clean his house and, and, and kind of just did that for a long time. And that was just a, a good example. And she, and she visited a lot of rest homes, a lot of people, um, just, just had a, a giving heart that way. And I always say I was fortunate to grow up in what I you know, like to describe as kind of a leave it to beaver family. It, it just, it was truly a great experience to grow up in a, and such a loving, supportive family. You know, my mom would go to just about all my you know, track and basketball games, and she always did, did the old, you know, if anybody can do it, Jimmy can. You know, I don't know how, how much she always believed that, but she, she said it with good conviction, so I, I believed it, so that was important. So, uh, you know, most importantly, though, she set a good example of what it looks like to be a godly mother and, uh, and a woman of God. You know, we had family devotions most every night, and uh, although some of those nights we got to laughing pretty good, and uh, mom got a... My dad was in, Cindy, and we were all in. Three of us were laughing pretty good. I don't know what the deal was, but Mom was, you know, just, just, she was always getting us back in the line here. But, uh, but we had a good time, and it was great. And she just, uh, you know, Chris prayed with us every night before we went to bed, and, and uh, she just showed us how to have courage through struggles and to rely on the Lord to get, get through those, and I'm thankful for that. She was a great wife as well to my dad and uh, modeled what Christian marriage should look like for us and the grandkids, and, and she also loved her granddaughters, uh, you know, very, very much. So... 
we will certainly miss her greatly, but we do look forward to seeing her again, of course, someday. And uh, just uh, that's, uh, of course, the hope we all have in Jesus. And uh, so I hope you enjoy the slideshow and get a little glimpse of her life uh, as what, uh, what we had growing up. All right. Thank you. I love you more than yesterday and I really loved you then and tomorrow I know I'll love you more for that's how it's always been I love you for the way you are you were always meant for me You have given me so much happiness You've shown me how good life can be Yes, I love you more than yesterday And tomorrow I love you more Every day with you is sweeter Than it was the day before I love you more than yesterday It could be no other way All the dreams that we dream together dear make loving you better each day I love you more than yesterday and I really loved you then and tomorrow I know I love you more For that's how it's always been I love you for the way you are You were always meant for me You have given me so much happiness You've shown me how good life can be Yes, I love you more than yesterday And tomorrow I love you more Every day with you is sweeter Than it was the day before I love you more than yesterday It could be no other way All the dreams that we dream together do Make loving you better will be there and angels will be too we'll be singing and shouting as we wait to welcome you on the front porch of heaven i'll be waiting for you on the front porch my mama used to sit and wait for me i'd come from school and we'd talk about how life should really be she'd say put your faith in jesus and always walk his way and on the front porch of heaven I'll wait for you someday on the front porch of heaven I'll be waiting for you Jesus will be there and angels will be too we'll be singing and shouting as we wait to welcome you on the front porch of heaven I'll be waiting for you on the front porch I feel 
of a loving mama's gentle hand. She'd tell about the Bible in a way I'd understand. She'd say, always love your neighbor and love God and obey. And on the front porch of heaven, I'll wait for you someday. On the front porch of heaven, I'll be waiting for you. Jesus will be there and angels will be too. We'll be singing and shouting as we wait to welcome you. On the front porch. goodbye when I left home. I moved away from town, but I would call mom on the phone. She'd say, tell your friends of Jesus and care for them and pray. And on the front porch of heaven, I'll wait for you someday. On the front porch of heaven, I'll be waiting for you. Jesus will be there and angels will be too. We'll be singing and shouting as we wait to welcome you on the front porch of heaven i'll be waiting for you on the front porch of heaven i'll be waiting for you <laughs> there are a lot of women in that pictures up there There's so much that could be said uh, about our mother. In the 79 years that God gave to her, where do you begin? It's really difficult. You just heard Cindy and Jim, her children, speak of her, and that was just a drop in a bucket of their influence, her influence in their life. By the way, I'm the favorite son-in-law. <laughs> Kim, you're the favorite daughter-in-law. I'm not going to go any further than that. Her husband, dad, if he was to come and speak, we'd be here all day because he thought the world of her. They were married 60 years last December, correct? 60 years. Do you know how many days that is? I do. It's over 21,900 days. Do you know how many meals that is? I don't. But you think about all the days and all the years they spent together, um, he would never speak cross about her. He would never put her down. Joke with her, yes, but never put her down. He would sing her praises continually. Her grandchildren adore her. And that's because she spoiled them. <laughs> she took them shopping, cooked whatever they wanted, and then sent them home. But more than that, she put her life into theirs. She influenced them, all in different ways. So I asked myself, what would mom want us to say about her? What would she want said at this time? I think she would want us to talk just a very little about her, but mostly about her Savior, Jesus Christ. Because of her love and faith in Christ, she loved serving him. What I want to do is to set a portrait of her before you so you have a, an idea of who she was and then tell you of her Savior and the hope that she had within. So what portrait would mom fit? Simply, mom fit God's portrait of a virtuous woman. The idea in Proverbs 31 is that this virtuous woman is precious not perfect. So I read it from that standpoint. She's precious. That's the portrait of God's woman. Listen to the writer of Proverbs, and I'm going to choose some verses, not the whole chapter. Who can find a virtuous wife? Actually, that word virtuous in Hebrew can be translated, who can find a woman of valor? 
I've often thought, wouldn't it be nice to have a section at a cemetery called the Women of Valor? The ones who take the responsibility that God has given to them very serious, like you heard her children talk about. She was a homemaker. She taught them how to, and the list goes on. Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. If you were to ask dad, she, he would say, yes, her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She willingly works with her hands, provides food for her household. She girds herself with strength. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is a law of kindness. She watches over the way of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her with these words. There are many fine women in the world, but you are the best of them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she will be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. See, a virtuous woman serves God with all of her heart and soul and mind. She wants his will for her life. A virtuous woman respects her husband. She does him good all the days of her life, and she is trustworthy, and she's a helpmeet. A virtuous woman teaches her children the ways of her heavenly father. She nurtures her children with the love of Christ and disciplines them with care and wisdom and trains them in the way they should go. A virtuous woman serves her husband and family and friends and neighbors with a gentle, loving spirit. She is charitable. A virtuous woman willingly works with her hands and does not grumble while completing the task. A virtuous woman is a homemaker, creating an atmosphere of love for her family. She is hospitable to others. A virtuous woman uses her time wisely, diligently, seeks to please the Lord in all that she does. A virtuous woman is a woman of inward beauty and outward. And because of her love for Christ, she loves others. But the one verse that I want to sort of land on this morning is she is a woman who fears or reverences or worships the Lord because she will be praised. Mom was a lady who had a deep reverence and love for God. She loved to serve the Lord. If there is one phrase that best describes mom, it would be a woman with a servant's heart. And I believe this is one of the highest callings in all of Scripture. The Bible talks about servants of Christ. They are held in high esteem. If you go to the book of Job, four times over, God calls Job my servant. The Apostle Paul refers to himself as the servant or the bond servant of Christ. Moses was referred to as the servant of God. Paul says to a young pastor, Timothy, as Paul is leaving the scene or leaving the life here on earth, and he says to Timothy, be a good servant. Be a good servant of Jesus Christ. And if you think of the greats in Scripture, they are servants of God. Esther. Ruth, Mary, Caleb, Joshua, and the list goes on. See, this was a badge of honor to be called the servant of God. So many times we are anxious to get to a place in life where we can be served, especially when we get older. Because we like to be served, and we think that's sort of, well, our right when we get older. Mom never considered it her right to be served. She loved to serve. Do you remember the words that Christians would love to hear when they come before the Lord? I think those words are recorded in Matthew chapter 25 when the Lord is talking with these stewards that were given a certain amount to invest. And his words to them were, after they had invested wisely, well done, my good and faithful what? Servant. Well done, my good and faithful servant. In the midst of all that mom went through in life, from a very young age, her greatest desire was to serve 
to serve the Lord. And she did so without complaining and without excuses. I've known her for over 30 years. I never, honestly, I did not hear her complain about serving. It was in her fabric. It was in her blood. It was in the way that she conducted herself to be the servant of the Lord. I think that she did all that she did, not for her family, but for the Lord. She was an incredible example to her children and grandchildren. We should all be this anxious to serve our King, Jesus Christ, and to do our very best every day where he's placed us and what he has called us to. Our cry should be, as an early church father said, help me to serve thee, O my God. Mom was always willing to serve her family, her church, her community. That was her drumbeat, a servant of the Lord. She cared for people near death. She cared for people for years in rest homes, visiting them regularly, weekly. She served by preparing food for the blind and cleaning their homes. She loved to serve at church wherever she could. In fact, because her life was well-lived, she became the inspiration of dad's, some of Dad's songs. One of those was, Jesus is the reason that I love you. And the reason why Mom loved people and served people was because of Jesus Christ in her life. I tell my children, if you want to be great, learn to serve. So then I ask him, can you get the salt, please? <laughs> Who wants to be great? <laughs> Susanna wants to be great. <laughs> we like to volunteer everybody to be great. So as mom entered the gates of the city, I would imagine she probably heard what? Well done, what? My good and faithful servant. If you're going to wear a badge, if you're going to wear honor, let it be the servant of the Lord. Yes, mom was prepared for heaven. Heaven is prepared, has, is a prepared place for prepared people. Jesus said in John 14, let not your heart be troubled. And then he says, I go and I prepare a place for you. What this means exactly, we do not know. But we will when we get there. See, it's already prepared. You don't have to wait outside until Christ gets your room ready or gets your table ready. Like when you go to a restaurant and they hand you one of those things that beep and buzz and shake and rattle and all the lights go on and then you can go to your table when you see that sign. You're not going to sit outside of heaven and wait until the Lord prepares a place for you. It's prepared. There's nothing second rate about heaven. Heaven is the seven star rating. The best of the best. It will be right, it will be royal. Christ is the greatest architect. There will be nothing more magnificent than the prepared place for you. Those who will be there before will say to us when we arrive, we are glad you are here. Come home. It's all prepared for you. Rutherford, that great preacher of bygone days, said this, all thou needest to make thee blessed, supremely blessed, is to be with Christ, which is far better than here. You see, where Jesus is, it's perfect. Where Jesus is will be heaven, and to be with Christ is far better than to be anywhere else. Spurgeon writes, we will live in a house that can never hasten to decay. We will wear a crown, the glistening of which will never be dim." We shall have a garment which will never wax old. No bliss will depart from us. We will firmly set like a pillar of marble in the temple of God. The world may rock, the tempest may sway the child's cradle, but there above the veil, above the perpetual revolution of the stars, the Christian stands secure and immovable. I like that. That's what I'm looking forward to. And that's where mom is today. It can be said, mom had secured her anchor of faith deep into the rocks of God's promise. 
She had gone to sleep in her chamber, and she has not feared the tempest. She has looked into the face of problems and suffering and all kinds of difficulties, and she smiled. She has faced death and said, I am not afraid. Because her faith has found a resting place in the cross of Jesus Christ, nothing was going to move her because she knew her Savior. Mom could say, as Job did in Job chapter 23, God knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot has held fast to his steps. I have kept his ways and not turned aside. I have not departed from the commandments of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. King David writes in Psalm 17, As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I will be steadfast when I awake in your likeness. There are many times that our eternal thinking gets a little stuck down here on earth. And sometimes we look at this life and we think horizontally just for right now, just for today or tomorrow, and we forget to look vertically. Mom's focus was not just horizontal and how she could serve down here, but also vertical for where she was going to spend eternity. She knew where she was going to spend eternity, and she looked forward to that day. My grandmother at 90 years old, I asked her, Grandma, let's, why don't you and I go to Jerusalem and go to Israel and just tour around and see where Jesus walked and enjoy that time? And she turned to me and she says, why should I go to Israel, Jerusalem? when I'm going to see my Lord very soon. She had, her, she had her focus vertical, not horizontal. Listen, none of us are going to get out of here alive unless the Lord comes in our lifetime. Mom knew that nothing would separate her from the love of God and that all the difficulties of life would all work together for good because she loved God. And she knew that neither death nor life nor anything present or anything to come would separate her from the love of God. Mom knew the thoughts that God had toward her. Those thoughts were of peace and not evil to give her a future and a hope. Mom fought a good fight. She finished the race. She's very strong. And she, most of all, kept the faith. The promise from God is there is a crown of righteousness which the Lord will give to her on that day. See, life every day is about courage. God told Jeremiah, no man will be able to stand before you. As I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Only be strong and very courageous. Be strong. Be courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Mom knew that. See, life is about courage. Therefore, this should lead us to a dauntless courage of this glory to be had. We should be like the hero of John Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress. I quote, Before the dreamer there stood a fair palace, a mansion, and he saw a person walking upon the top of it, clad in light and shining. Around the door stood armed men to keep back those who would enter. Then a brave lady came to the, to the one who had a writer's inkhorn by his side, and she said, set down my name in the book. And straightway the warrior drew her sword, fought daily with all her might until she cut her way to the door, and then she entered, and they within were heard to say, Come in, come in to the eternal glory. Thou hast won, thou hast fought a good fight, thou hast kept the faith. Then we who are here will sing, safe in the arms of Jesus. No more tears, no more pain, no more surgeries, no death, no sorrow, it's all passed away. And then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. 
You can tell a lot about a Christian by picking up their Bible and looking at it. So I picked up Mom's Bible and looked at it. There's too much to tell you about in, in her Bible. But I'm going to tell you a few things. She marks some passages in Scripture. She marks Psalm 118. The verse that says, This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. She marks Psalm 116. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. She marks Psalm 103. And the list goes on and on. Ever wonder how it would be entering heaven for the first time? I wonder what she experienced or what she thought or what she might have said. Maybe it went something like this. I dreamed of a city called glory, so bright and so fair. When I entered the gates, I cried holy. The angels all met me there. They showed me from mansion to mansion, and oh, the sights I saw. But I said I want to see Jesus, the one who died for all. As I entered the gates of that city, my loved ones all knew me well. They took me down the streets of heaven. The scenes were too numerous to tell. I saw Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Mark, Luke, and Timothy. But I said I want to see Jesus, the one who died for me. Then I bowed on my knees and cried, holy, holy, holy. I clapped my hands and sang glory, glory to the Son of God. Charles Spurgeon was asked by a friend about death and if he was afraid. And Spurgeon said this, I have no fear of going home. I have sent all before me. God's finger is on the latch of my door and I am ready for him to enter. But, said my friend, are you afraid lest you should miss your inheritance? Nay, said I, nay. There is one crown in heaven that, no, that the angel Gabriel could not wear. It, is fit no, it will fit no head but mine. There is one throne in heaven that Paul, the apostle, could not fill. It was made for me, and I shall have it. There is one dish at the banquet table that I must eat, or else it will be untasted. For God has set it apart for me, absent from the body, present with the Lord for all of eternity. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And so will your place in heaven, and no one else can have it. Isn't that good? No one else can take it. So I know that mom's in heaven and she's got her place and my place is there, and she's not taking my place. <laughs> but she's waiting for me. So if mom could return and speak today, this I do know, and I want you to know, that she would tell you that her Redeemer lives. Because she has seen him herself. She might come and stand here and she might quote you a, a verse that she has on a bookmarker in her Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I think she would probably come stand here, and for the first time in a long time, her voice would be strong, and she would say, folks, I just want you all to know, there is eternal life. Life is very short. No guarantees, but I want you to know there is eternal life. And you need to be ready in this life for eternal life. I think she'd tell you that because she would love you so much that she would want to make sure that, well, that you set your name in the book, in the book, the Lamb's Book of Life. You see, it was God's amazing grace that brought mom to eternal salvation as a child. It was God's amazing grace that brought mom through the very hard times of her life. It was God's amazing grace that lifted her to heaven on February 26. And it was God's amazing grace that made her perfectly brand new. And now she has the privilege of being in the presence of Almighty God, worshiping him, singing and shouting and thanking him 
for his amazing grace. stand with me as we close in prayer and please remember that you're all invited afterwards the food is ready um, and you don't have to wait um, it's just go and enjoy and we'll see you back there father thank you so much for mom thank you for the way you have placed her in our lives not only as a family but also as church and community and the way she touched so many people's lives in so many different ways and help us to learn from her example of a servant's heart. Help us to pick up the baton and run the race that is set before us. And to learn from those who have gone on before us. So that we might run faithfully the race that you have placed us in, individually, wherever you place us. Thank you for her life, for her example. Thank you for the example that her and dad set for her children for the faithfulness that they've had with each other for 60 years and dear God I pray that you would be with dad and mom's kids that they will continue in the ministry that God gives to them until the day that you call them home and we'll thank you now for what you're going to do in our lives as individuals as we choose to be your servants each day that you called us to live on this earth. Thank you for the food. We ask that you would bless this food to strengthen us and keep us safe as we travel. For I pray this in essence in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you for being here.